You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Elena Steen. Elena has spent the last decade as an organic farmer and native plant gardener. Elena and her partner, Danny, are the owners of Night Heron Farm, an herbal medicine company and CSA. Elena and Danny also grow organic cut flowers for market and offer a flower CSA as well. Elena believes that growing and producing local medicine is a way to contribute to a more just and sustainable world. You can visit Elena online at nightheronfarm.org. Welcome to Sustainable World Radio, Elaine. I'm so glad to have you here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's so exciting. And I um, know that you grow your herbal offerings in what you call a magical oak woodland garden. Can you just tell our listeners a, a, just a few things about your farm that you think we'd like to know? Sure. So we grow as the crow flies, probably just about two miles inland from the coast. Uh, We're about a 12 minute drive away from the coast. And so we're really influenced by the coastal fog, the marine layer Um, and the side, we live on the north facing side of the mountain. So we're surrounded by a really healthy, mature oak forest that has survived a number of wildfires at this point. Um, So we are, We've carved out basically the only two flat, sunny spots on the property that we rent and have slowly been feeding the soil and creating pretty wild, eclectic gardens. So we have a mix of native plants and a lot of the food that we eat and then the medicinal plants that we use for teas and tinctures all in the same garden. And the aesthetic is very wild and it's very informed by the forest since it's really just, you know, five or six feet away from a pretty dense and diverse woodland. So our garden is home to a lot of really cool insects and butterflies and wild birds that are really attracted to what is kind of a messy, very organic looking garden. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And I wish I could be there. Um, And we had planned doing this live. Well, after COVID, we will definitely, I'd love to come out and see it. And how many different herbs would you say that you grow there? Oh, gosh. Um, (laughs) Well, some (laughs) some things we have just one or two of that are more experimental or for our personal use. And those are really incorporated into kind of our dense, Foodscape, and then we also have a few more straightforward rows of medicinal plants of the same species. So I would say probably um, maybe like twenty-five mm-hmm. or thirty different kinds of medicinal plants. Um, not all of them that we're using to make products that we sell, but some of them just because we love them or they we want them near us, or we're using them for ourselves as well. Uh, It must be so nice to be out there in that semi-wild herbal garden, and I bet you can just really feel that medicinal plant energy. Yeah, it's so sweet, and it's so wonderful to feel like we're also making a home for a lot of the woodland animals. Like we have a quail family that lives in our garden and takes dust baths and eats the chamomile all the time, and Mm-hmm. We have hawks living right above us, and it it definitely feels like um, a really dense and diverse part of the forest in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. Oh, that's so great. You have very calm quail. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We always we always joke that the gophers are just meditating underground because they're eating so many really calming medicinal plants. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, the gopher in my yard is chowed down. First it was the um Nicotiana, the night blooming tobacco. Oh, yeah. And then he went for the motherwort, I think the plant was called. He ate that whole uh-huh. thing. So maybe that was an antidote for the tobacco. I don't know. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we're going to be chatting a lot about some of your favorite herbs and also how to start an apothecary garden. But before we go in that direction, I just wanted to ask you. Why are you an advocate? Why do you suggest that people um, grow some of their own herbal medicine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of the same reasons are the same reasons that it feels so special to grow even some small part of your own food. Um, It's just such a really lovely and inspiring process from planting a seed to being able to make yourself food or medicine. And I feel like our, all of our human lineage is so connected to the plant world and, and being a part of that just feels like part of the healing of medicinal plants for me. Um, We're super fortunate that I think even just in the last five years or so, there's become a lot more um, small scale organic herb farms that do sell they're dried herbs in bulk around the country. And so it used to be that very often you were importing herbs from abroad and they were maybe kind of old and not as fresh. And um, I think even that has changed in the last little while. So the argument of, you know, the more local, the better still certainly exists, but maybe isn't quite as pressing. So at this point, I feel like a huge part of it is just being able to work with the plants and I feel like both myself and my partner neither of us went to herb school we did a apprenticeship at a medicinal herb farm where we learned a whole lot but a lot of what we've learned has just come from working with these plants in the garden and and watching where they grow and how they grow and understanding those habits as a clue to how they work in our own bodies so you can just learn a lot from from growing the plants. Mm, that's so wonderful. So it really is for people who have never grown um, any medicinal herbs. I just wanted to bring up that culinary herbs are quite easy yeah. to grow. And I've also, I found that often they're one and the same. Absolutely. Yeah. I think a part of me when I first started to grow a lot of these plants, it was just, it's always exciting if you're a plant nerd to grow new plants. And so I was most excited by the kind of like tricky obscure plants and it took me a while to kind of come back around and realize that a lot of the culinary herbs that are really readily available and easily to grow are just as strong medicine like rosemary and basil and culinary sage um, parsley cilantro these are all incredibly healing plants too exactly and we'll learn about some of those in in a bit so before we start talking about plants I'd love to chat a bit about growing practices for medicinal herbs. And you mentioned something, um, you came to an herbal exchange meeting, um, which was a group we started that was really fun. And you gave a wonderful talk and you mentioned, I think it was benevolent neglect when you grow medicinal herbs. (laughs) I always think of that when I'm like, I'm not going to water you Tulsi, sorry. (laughs) Um, can you, can you tell us what that means? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you remembered that. Um, Yeah, so with medicinal herbs in particular, a lot of the plant chemicals that are really medicinal and healing for us are actually initially the plant's um, response to stress or its attempt to heal itself. So in fact, if you, you know, limit the water or don't worry too much about amending the soil, you're creating an environment in which the medicinal plants will really be challenged to grow and heal themselves. And those same chemicals are also what work in our body as medicine. So we're so fortunate that a lot of these medicinal plants are so, so easy to grow and that their medicine actually is stronger and 
more potent if you <laughs> benevolently <laughs> neglect them, as you said. So not worrying too much about like letting there be periods of drought and not worrying too much if bugs or birds are nibbling on your plants because all of those experiences actually really make the medicine stronger. Mm, interesting. And so as far as soil preparation, because we know that's so important when we're growing at least annuals, right? Um, mm -hmm. Annual vegetables. How would you prepare, say you have a little patch um, in your yard or garden and you want to grow some medicinals, how would you prepare the soil for that? Yeah, so most medicinal plants that we grow just aren't going to need as much fertility as the vegetables that we grow. Um, in general, they're just a little closer to being their, their wild plant cells. And so they do really well in um, less rich soil than vegetables do. We still add either compost or really aged manure. Um, in this area where we live and grow horse, old horse manures is readily available and people are actually really happy if you come and get it from their places. Um, but we, we make our own compost and then we supplement with really aged horse manure. So we'll add that to the soil. Um, the garden that we started with was pretty intense, really dense clay. Like I remember when we first moved to our place, we had to pickaxe into the soil to even open up the crust of the earth. And I was a little intimidated by that coming from the southeast. I grew up in North Carolina where the soil is just really rich from being a forest for so long. Um, but the, the clay here is really responsive to compost. And we've just made really, really lovely soil only with compost in our home garden. Um, so we'll open the earth. We do that either with, we have a little walk behind pillar or just a shovel or a spading fork and then layer pretty generous like four to six inches of compost or old manure onto the soil and then stir that into the soil either by hand or with the walk behind pillar um, and begin to add water so we'll irrigate a little bit and get the soil microorganisms kind of woken up and ready to go. So I think it, it makes more sense when you're thinking about building healthy soil to think about feeding the microorganisms in the soil, because that's really what, what you're doing if you're using regenerative or organic growing practices. Um, so those microorganisms love that rich, wet soil. Um, so compost has just been our best friend, and we started with pretty rough soil and it's just gotten better and better every year oh that's so great yeah yeah and we often especially like I said the medicinal herbs that just don't require as much feeding um, we've also started to plant into areas where we haven't added any compost we have in the past but maybe we didn't over the winter we just cover crops and that's been working well too so but I would recommend adding compost when you begin that's great to know. And then do you ever add any like amendments as you're growing the plants or compost tea or anything or not so much? You know what, for the, for the herbs, we really don't. Um, I would for vegetables, compost tea is really amazing. Um, but for the herbs, once they're in the ground, we really <laughs> kind of just let them do their thing. <laughs> it's easy gardening, I love it. And yeah, then <laughs> yeah. as far as cover cropping, can you, uh, I would imagine you could grow like a cover crop like um, oats or something and then actually mm -hmm. harvest that for your medicine as well. Absolutely, we do. Yeah, so milky oats are, yes, from our winter cover crop. Um, we do a, a winter rest for all of the soil in our garden other than a little bit that we reserve to just grow some winter veggies. Um, so we do a mix of fava beans, which then we'll also eat in the spring, and peas and milky oats. And so as far as watering, we share a Mediterranean climate. We know that all not all listeners are in a Mediterranean climate, but just as far as watering goes, do you have like a rule of how dry you actually let the herbs get, or do you do it by feel, or what's your, um, what, do you have any tips for that? Yeah. yeah, I do it by feel. Where we live, is just so variable. Um, so here in Southern California, since we're coastal influence, a lot of 
April, May, June, July can be quite foggy and maybe the fog will break in the afternoon. And we live enough inland that it can also get quite hot in the summer. So it's kind of all over the place. So I always just do it by feel. Um, so all we mulch uh, most of our gardens. And so I'll reach under the mulch, which is just this thick layer of either wood chips or straw that protects the soil surface from drying out. So it conserves water and again, just makes a happier home for all those microorganisms. So I'll reach under there and generally I won't irrigate until the top two inches feel dry to the touch. So I definitely let the garden soil dry out before I water. And in fact, I think that's just a really essential best practice in this area where we need to be really conservative with our water use. And again, that limited watering and that introduction of a certain amount of stress to the plants makes them stronger. Even in the summer when it's getting quite hot, we probably just irrigate, we use drip irrigation. Um, we irrigate when it's really hot, maybe every five days but when it's kind of just a normal summer day we're probably irrigating just once a week and sometimes even stretching it out if it stays foggy for most of the morning and is kind of dewy we'll maybe just be irrigating every 10 days more in the spring and fall. And how long do you run the irrigation? Usually about three hours. Hmm. That would save on water. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think the rule of thumb, and even most veggies are like this, but um, a deep, thorough, infrequent watering is a much better um, way to irrigate than an everyday shallow water. Um, it's good preventative health, too, because a lot of summer diseases and a lot of insects are attracted to overly moist conditions in a garden. So you're being proactive if you keep your garden a little drier. I better go turn the hose off. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think I overwater. I'm guilty. Um, <laughs> it's, it's good to know. It's easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It feels like you're showing love to the plants by giving them water. But yeah, it's actually good to let them dry out a little. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to share with listeners about growing the herbs before we move on? Um, not really. I mean, it, it, it's really as simple as we just said. They really do well making a little world for themselves. <laughs> They're very easy. And so for harvesting, do you um, prefer dried or fresh plant material to make your medicine? Hmm. Um, I, I, a part of me prefers fresh. But I don't really think that there's a difference in their medicinal activity. Um, I, I just love fresh tincturing. I just love the experience of putting fresh living plants into a jar. Um, but with dried plants, if you dry them well, which we will talk about, um, you're, it's just as good as the fresh material. And that, that is really the hard part, right, is drying well. And I have tried all different yeah. ways. Do you have favorite ways to dry plants to ensure that they don't get moldy? Yeah, that is that was probably what I felt the most intimidated about when I first started growing medicinal herbs because, um, yeah, I was just so worried about things molding or rotting, and it took me a while to trust myself. Um but it really is something where you can really use and trust your senses to let you know when plants are fully dry. So we, it's really important. I would say the most important thing to remember about drying plants is that they should be dried out of the sun. They should be in a totally dark environment. So we harvest a lot of our plants when it's sunny and warm, especially for our leaf and flower crops the heat of the day will bring a lot of those essential oils to the surface and makes the medicine just a lot stronger. But once they're taken away from the plant too dry, it's really important to keep them in a cool, dark environment. So, or not, not necessarily cool, I shouldn't say that, a dark environment. Um, so we turn our greenhouse into a drying shed in the summer 
by covering the entire structure with really thick light blocking tarp. So there's really no sun getting in. And that's the most important thing is just not to dry your herbs in direct sunlight. Um, it's also really important to, we use big screens so that there's airflow all around the plant. And we do only one layer of plants on a screen so we never do thick piles of plants because especially a lot of herbs that are really high in volatile oils like tulsi or lemon balm if they're um, too densely stacked they can rot really quickly because there's all that oil in the leaves um, so that's really important to do just a single layer and it's all about touch to it after a certain point like people can get very technical but really your senses can tell you when a plant is fully dried and a dry plant, a plant that's ready to be stored will really just crumble off the stem to the touch. So we harvest whole plants, we'll remove the stems after they're dry in a process that's called garbling. And so we know that it's time to do that when the leaves just naturally crumble off the stem. And do you wash the plant material before you lay it out to dry or not? No, we don't. Nope. Yeah, the times I've done that, it seems like they don't dry as quickly and I've had mold. Totally. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, there's definitely insects and dirt and all of these things, but um, I think it's better not to wash your herbs. I always am like, oh, the dirt's good for you. (laughs) And do you um, save seeds at all from your plants? Yeah. Yeah, we definitely do. Um, A lot of what we grow are annual herbs, and they're really good at planting themselves. So we also let things go to seed in our field because I would say we just rented a new field um, that is closer to the coast where we're also growing medicinal plants. Um, We're still tilling there, but in our older, more established gardens, we're not really tilling anymore. So a lot of plants just reappear every spring on their own Um, but we do save seeds as well a lot of the medicinal herbs that we grow are really vigorously seed producing and they're really easy to save seed from Mm, I love those calendula it's calendula borage and comfrey just pop it's like oh hi friends you're back it's great I know (laughs) I know yeah a lot of medicinal herbs are basically just weeds and they'll come back over and over again whether you want them or not (laughs) but I always want them (laughs) well let's let's start talking about your ideal apothecary garden and we know that people live in different regions so these plants may not be able to grow where you are but there's usually a a similar plant that would grow in your region because I really believe that the medicine we need is outside of our door um Mm -hmm. and so how do you um Elena decide what to grow in your garden yeah we are really focused on I would say in particular on plants that really help our bodies to deal with stress and anxiety it just seems like a lot of the plants that people need in this moment but I I think also just in in modern life as it is right now Um, so we have a lot of plants for stress and anxiety and for changing how our bodies are triggered by stress we have a lot of plants for sleep Um, and we're so fortunate that there's even with just like eight or ten plants in your garden you can have a pretty diverse amount of medical actions available to you because a lot of medicinal herbs have multiple uses which when I first started to learn about them was felt pretty intimidating or overwhelming or confusing that a plant could do so many different things and some of them kind of seemed opposite but I think that's really just a reflection of the complexity of plant bodies and of our human bodies and something else I should also say is kind of no matter what a book says a plant does you should always listen to your body first and if something does or doesn't feel good to you you should really honor that and pay attention to that um so that aside we have really focused we rent where we are um so in the future there's a lot of 
much more long-lived perennial herbal medicines that I'm really excited to grow when we're somewhere more permanently. But in the meantime, we've mostly focused on really easy to grow annual herbs with a diversity of, of functions. Ooh, so let's let's talk about some of your favorite herbs to grow. What what do you want to start with? What's one of your faves? My favorite plant is Tulsi or holy basil. <laughs> um, Tulsi is originally from India. But in our experience has done really well, even we were first farming up in Northern California, right on the coast where it's quite cool and foggy, basically year round. And even though Tulsi is a tropical herb, it did really, really well, even in that climate. Um, so I've, Tulsi is just so easy to grow. And even just one plant will provide you with so much medicine through a growing season. Um, it's also just a really lovely plant and definitely one of the most beloved plants by pollinators in our garden. The Tulsi is always covered with native bumblebees and foraging honeybees and sphinx moths and it's just a hive of activity during the growing season. A lot of medicinal herbs are really, really supportive to pollinators as well. So if you're including medicinal herbs into an existing landscape or adding a few to your vegetable garden, they're also just amazing companion plants for the, the plants you might already have around you. And they just make your, your garden ecosystem that much more diverse and, and welcoming to insects. Um, but Tulsi is just such an amazing everyday herb. I think most of the plants that I wanted to talk about today are all plants that you can take tonically. So they're plants that you can't take too much of um, and they are really complementary to any kind of pharmaceutical or over-the-counter medicine that you might be on. They're not gonna mess up any sort of care regimen you might already have. They're just a really great addition. Um, and Tulsi is just this amazing herb where if you are able to take it every day, it works better and better in your body. It's one of the adaptogens that's the easiest to grow. So adaptogens are a kind of medicinal herb that is relaxing and soothing to your nervous system, but maybe even more importantly, will actually work within your endocrine system and your hormone regulation to alter how your body responds to stress in the first place. So they're plants that will help while you're having a stress reaction, but they're also plants that the more consistently you're able to take them, the more robust your response to stress will become. Um, and I think those are just such important plants for all of us to have in our daily lives right now. Um, obviously a lot is happening in the world right now and stress over time is actually really harmful to all different kinds of our body systems, our nervous system, our digestive system, our immune system. And I think the more that we're able to support a healthy stress response, the better off we are. And Tulsi is just such a simple way to do that. Tulsi tea is delicious and you can just grow one little Tulsi plant outside your front door on your porch and walk outside and snip enough tea to drink every day. Yeah, they're amazing. And just being around the plants and working with the aromas of the plants, I think mm. is a stress reliever. Yeah, yeah. Tulsi is one of the cornerstones of Ayurvedic medicine in India, which is just such a profound, many thousands of years old way to understand plant and human interactions. And Tulsi is really, really revered in that healing tradition for kind of being this mother of all plants mm. and and yeah it's just such a special plant oh i know tulsi is wonderful and i know there's a few different types you can grow mm -hmm. yeah yeah so we most of what we grow in our garden is a kind what is it called temperate tulsi and so it's an annual but there's also several perennial forms of Tulsi. Um, there's a bush Tulsi that is originally, I think, from Africa, and a few different kinds of perennial Tulsi from India as well. And 
grow they all taste really different they have i think pretty similar properties but a really traditional ayurvedic preparation would probably have at least three kinds of tulsi in it wow and yeah. i think we're going to be doing um a whole episode on tulsi on the plant report yeah. so if you're interested in tulsi tune into that podcast and you'll get to hear more about this amazing plant it's one of my favorites i have to say yeah it's so special so what's another plant that you really um, adore and would, would suggest that people grow in their gardens? I think the other, if I could only grow two plants in my medicine garden, it would probably be Tulsi and then Calendula. Um, calendula is just so easy to grow. It will really grow anywhere. It will become a weed in your garden if you let it go to seed. And it's uh, just got, has a lot of different functions in our body. So it's really multi-purpose. It's really great for first aid. If you infuse the petals into a steam or a bath or an oil that you would apply topically on your skin, it has a lot of really wound healing properties. The A lot of the chemistry in calendula is connected to stimulating cellular regrowth and regeneration. So it's a, a really good ally for healing from cuts or scars or surgery. Um, and if you take it internally, it has a lot of those similar properties of, of supporting your body's ability to heal itself. Um, it's also a really strong lymphatic herb, which is an important thing to include in any sort of self-care. Our lymph system is the part of our body. It's parallel to our circulatory system. And it's part of our body's way of removing or flushing toxins and pathogens from our body. Um, so having plants that really support our body's ability to cleanse itself is really important for our health. I should say that I, my experience is mostly in growing these plants. And I've been able to learn so much from books and from people and the plants themselves. But I'm not a clinical herbalist by any means. Um, <laughs> so that disclaimer aside, um, our lymphatic system is, is really interesting because it's a part of our body that's really connected to movement, but doesn't actually have an organ that tells that movement, if that makes sense. So like our circulatory system has our heart, our nervous system has our brain, our respiratory system has our lungs. The lymphatic system doesn't have a central organ that's creating movement. And so plants are especially important at helping that because it's a really important avenue that our bodies have for expelling something harmful. For that reason, calendula is just an awesome immune supporting herb too. Wow. And you know what? I didn't know you could take it internally because I've just made oil out of it, which I love. And so for lymphatic support, would oh, you yeah. rub the oil on those areas or internal or internally ingest it? Both. Both are amazing. Um, so calendula is really great as a topical oil or you can infuse calendula. You can take the oil internally, like if you infuse calendula into an olive oil, for example, Um or you can tincture with either vinegar or alcohol and, and take that internally. Ooh, a new way to use it. I love it. I have all these babies popping up all over the place. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. So when you eat calendula flowers, they're really bitter to the, to the taste. And that's also a clue. There's this um, really wonderful way of looking at herbal medicine that's called the doctrine, doctrine of signatures. And it's, this understanding that where or how plants grow, how they interact with one another, what they look like, what they taste like, are all clues to how these plants can work in your body. And often a taste of bitterness is connected to our digestion and our liver. Um, so calendula flowers taste bitter, which is also a clue to the fact that they're really good for your digestion, again, because of that kind of bright moving force. Oh, interesting. So I assume that you are using the fresh flowers in your medicine making or both. Yeah, both. We also dry a lot so that we have 
I mean, one of the appeals of drying herbs is that then you have access to them during the cold season. So we dry a lot of calendula. Oh, I love that plant. Oh, it's And it's so cheery. And like you were saying, the pollinators go nuts for it. They yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah. I just think of it like it's such little sun faces. And so I just think mm-hmm. of this really warming circulatory energy. Hmm. And what other plants um, would you would you like in your apothecary garden? So another plant that I think of as quite essential is yarrow, which is native to where we live in California. Um, it was also native to where I lived and grew up in North Carolina. There's also a kind of yarrow that is in Europe. Um, it seems like a, a plant that can do well in a lot of different situations, probably not a really, really hot, dry climate. Um, but yarrow is an awesome plant to include in an apothecary. Insects love it. It's actually a plant that is really attractive to beneficial insects that will help to keep any sort of pesty insect population under control in your garden. So it's just a really good organic gardening practice to include yarrow in your planting. Um, it's also a really great plant for first aid because it's able to stop bleeding really quickly. Um, even from pretty deep cuts. So I think it's a really good plant to be able to recognize in the woods and to have available to you in your home garden. Um, So if you're in any sort of a situation where you need to stop bleeding quickly, the fastest, easiest thing to do is just to make a poultice, which basically means to mash up the leaves and flowers to get some of the moisture extracted. And you can chew it and stick it on a cut or use a mortar and pestle if you have a little more time. Um, But it's also a really great immune system herb. So it's really antibacterial and antiviral, which is another reason why it's good to apply to a fresh wound. Um, But it has that same effect taken internally as a vinegar or as an alcohol tincture. It's really good for your immune system um, to kind of trigger an immune response through this kind of warming property that the plant has. And so with yarrow, and you may have said this already, and I missed it, but you're using the flowers. You can use the leaves and the flowers. Ooh, okay, good to know. And then what about for calendula, the flowers? Flowers, yep. And then the tulsi is the leaf. Leaf and flower, Mm mm-hmm. Yarrow, I didn't know. I've I've seen it growing. I don't have any growing in my garden, so I'm definitely going to get some seeds. Yeah, and it's really it really takes over. So especially if you have a place where it's allowed to spread, it's really good at at propagating itself. I think that's really good if you have herbs that you love to utilize and you just love being around them. To have plants cover the bare soil is always um, superior to having that soil just uncovered. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so many medicinal plants just are waiting for an excuse to take over. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So any other plants that come to mind that you're just like, yes, I want those in my herb garden. Yeah. I really value rosemary. So we were talking about culinary herbs that can also be medicinal. And I think one of the best examples of that is rosemary, um, which does, it's, Rosemary is also from a Mediterranean climate, so it does really well in California. Um, in a lot of other places it, where it rains a lot more, you might actually want to keep rosemary somewhere where it stays a little drier, if possible, um, to kind of mimic that Mediterranean environment. But rosemary is just, aromatherapy is so important, and it's, I think for me it was kind of an underrated part of herbalism when I first started learning more about plants and their actions, but I've really come to understand that scent is just one of the ways that our bodies can shift most immediately. Um, So rosemary just has this really wonderful fragrance and is really connected to our heads and our brains. So it's a plant that actually brings oxygen into your blood and towards your head. So it's a really great plant to have around if you are prone to headaches, for example. 
Um, it's also a really great plant for your immune system for that same reason, just kind of nourishing and refreshing and reoxygenating your blood. Um, and it's a plant that kind of feeds your brain. So we have a, a formula that we make that is for mental clarity and focus. And rosemary is a part of that. It's a, it's an herb that's really connected to your mind. Um, and it also has a lot of properties that are, um, it's considered a nervine, which is a kind of medicinal herb that is really calming and soothing. And rosemary in particular, a lot of people have success in treating um, mild to moderate cases of depression with rosemary. Ooh, that's good to know. So yeah, it's a culinary herb that I, I think of it most as a culinary herb, but it's actually also a very powerful herbal medicine. Uh, I know. And that fragrance, it's so like pungent and strong and uplifting. So I could see how it would yeah, bring yeah. that uplifting energy. Oh, I, I could talk about plants for like days. <laughs> <laughs> me too it's basically uh, all so I know. <laughs> that's how I ended up even doing a podcast because my partner Kevin was like oh, oh my god cool. all you do is talk about permaculture and plants why don't you like do a radio show on it that was like 15 years ago and I'm like oh my god that's a great idea <laughs> oh that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> oh, so any other plants that you want to um, spotlight today yeah so a plant that is quite easy to grow in a lot of different climates is ashwagandha, which I feel has received a lot of attention lately as one of the superfood herbs. Um, it is related to tomatoes and it has really similar growing requirements. So if you're in a place where tomatoes grow pretty well, it's probably also really easy to grow ashwagandha. And I mentioned that tulsi is an herb from the Ayurvedic tradition in India, and I would say ashwagandha is probably the other most important healing herb in that tradition. Um, it's another adaptogen, those kinds of plants that I mentioned before that not only calm and soothe you in the moment, but also shift how your body responds to stress in the first place. Um, and another really sweet element about ashwagandha is that if you take ashwagandha before you sleep, it promotes really deep and restful sleep and also kind of creative or visionary mm -hmm. dreaming. So if you're trying to work more with the dream world in your life, ashwagandha is a really great plant for that as well. So unlike the other plants I'm talking about, that's a root harvest, which is still annual. So it's a plant that you would plant in the early spring and then once the foliage has died back or slowed down in late fall or early winter, that's the traditional time to do root harvest once the growing energy of the plant has returned to the ground. So it's a plant that you're able to dig after the, its first year of growth. Um, and you want, to, you want to dig ashwagandha not any later than two years after you've planted it, because at that point, the roots pretty old and more pissy so they're not as potent um, but it's a really easy plant to save seed from again and replant every year or if you allow it to set seed it will always come back in your garden Ooh, I know I love ashwagandha what a great word what a great name yeah <laughs> I know there's so many plants and I would just do you want to mention any others that you work with <laughs> I know it's dangerous to keep asking me this um, <laughs> another plant that I would really recommend everyone growing is lemon balm. It's really easy to grow. It is in the mint family, which is a family where the plants have a tendency to take over. So be warned of that. Um, and it's another plant that will self seed really easily if you allow it to set seed. And lemon balm is you can treat it as an annual, but it's really more like a biennial. So it should come back once or twice after the spring that you've planted it. Um, it's this really beautiful electric green herb, and it makes a really delicious tea. And it's one of the best herbs for calming anxiety. 
and really helping to settle your stomach and your mind. And it's also a really good herb for kids. It's really sweet tasting. So kids really like to drink the tea or they'll be really into a vinegar or alcohol tincture of lemon balm because it's really tasty. Um, so it's one of the plants that we use a lot for my eight-year-old niece who can kind of get the zoomies over the course of a day and have kind of a hard time winding down and being ready for sleeping at night. Um, so it's a really great herb to have around for kids in particular. Mm, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Because often herbs don't taste so good. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel like a lot of herbal medicine is kind of famous for being very intense tasting. And lemon balm is just a delicious tea. And similar to all the other plants we've talked about, really the more, well, other than ashwagandha, the more you pick the leaves and flowers, the more they'll grow. They all really love to be pruned. So lemon balm, our lemon balm kind of goes dormant once there's one frost in our garden. Um, so we usually have lemon balm available in our garden from, I would say, early March until late November. And in that time, we're probably doing full above ground leaf harvest every month. It's just an incredibly vigorous, productive plant. So wonderful. I wish we could continue talking about plants for like hours, but I think we, I really want to talk about how you make medicine with them. But lastly, is there one other plant that you feel like you wanted to mention that we didn't have time for? Uh, hmm. <laughs> I think the, yeah, I think the final plant that I would consider an essential apothecary plant is chamomile, which um, I feel like a lot of people, chamomile reminds them of their grandma. <laughs> like it's just this classic sleepy time tea. It's a really beautiful flower. It's again annual, but will self seed to come back again and again in your garden. And there's these lovely, delicate yellow and white flowers that you use only the flower of chamomile. And it makes kind of a bitter tea it's really nice to sweeten with honey and again that bitterness is an indication of its connection to digestion and it's another plant that is just really calming and mellowing to your belly and your digestive system and your mind and your nervous system which is why I think why it's called sleepy time tea because it is a plant that will kind of help your body to relax and wind down and be able to sleep I know even talking about it makes me relaxed <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's just one of the most beautiful medicinal herbs, too. I love it. And it also is um, really good for your skin as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, we often will make herbal oils and include that as a salve or as a face cream ingredient because it is really good for your skin. Let's talk a bit about medicine. We're reining ourselves in from continuing on with the plants. And we'll <laughs> we're going to talk a bit about <laughs> medicine making. And so some of the ways that um, it sounds like the medicines that you like to make, one of them that I would love to hear about is herbal honeys. Yeah. Yeah. Honey is just the best medium for <laughs> making medicine. So in general, if you're making a fresh tincture of anything, the general rule of thumb is a one to two ratio. So one part fresh plant material to twice that volume of whatever you're extracting into. And that can be alcohol, high proof alcohol, it can be apple cider vinegar, it can be any kind of carrier oil, it can be honey. And we make all of our medicine in big half gallon jars. And so it's very easy to do a firm firmly packed half jar of plants and then simply pour whatever we're extracting into to the top of the jar. And honey is just everything that I'm talking about as a menstruum, which is the fancy word for the, the uh, extractant that you're using. These are all preservatives. So it's very, you can rest assured that anything that you make as an herbal medicine will be quite long lasting. Um, but honey is just one of the best ways to take medicine. It's delicious. It extracts really well. 
Um, either if you allow the herbs to sit in honey at room temperature for a few weeks, or if you're making a root medicine, say like an ashwagandha honey, I would actually recommend using a double boiler and very, very gently warming the honey to allow the, the root herbs to infuse a little better. Um, always be careful not to overheat honey, especially if you're using a raw local honey, because honey itself just has so many medicinal properties and is so healing on its own. So wonderful. And it tastes so sweet and good, you know, with the herbal addition in there with the herbal um, yeah, benefits. Yeah. Our other favorite way to make medicine is as an oxymel. So that's a non-alcoholic option for tincturing where we infuse herbs into apple cider vinegar and honey. And that's a really traditional preparation. And it's so delicious. The tartness of the vinegar with the sweetness of the honey is just so yummy. Uh, I tried. I bought your adapt um, oximal. Oh, it was so. Oh, yeah. It was so, so good. good. The tuls with tulsi in it with the honey and the uh -huh. vinegar. You're right. It's kind of that opposite flavors that just come together so nicely. Yeah. And so the oximals and the herbal honeys and herbal vinegars are another thing that you can make, mm -hmm. as well as tinctures. All of these then do have medicinal qualities. So for people who are trying to avoid alcohol, there are um, other choices. Absolutely. Yeah. And then could you tell us, is it the same rule? So for an oximal, it's one part plant, two parts vinegar, and then you mm -hmm. add honey at the end, or do you add it in the beginning? You can do both. The way that we usually do it, um, because you have to, ultimately, you'll have to strain the plant material out of whatever you're extracting into. And it's a lot easier to strain plants out of vinegar than out of mm -hmm. honey. <laughs> so we usually will make a pure, really strong herbal vinegar. And then once we've strained that, which means for us uh, pouring through two layers of cheesecloth and then really, really firmly squeezing out the herbs that remain in the cheesecloth, we'll add honey after that. And it's really to your taste. I would say we generally do about a quarter part honey to vinegar. Yum. It sounds great. And are you, do, when you'd make oximals or tinctures, um, do you combine plants or do you do separate, you know, plant tinctures you or oximals? Can do, you can really do either. Um, I love to take simples, which is what a one plant tincture is called, because then it feels like you really get to know what that particular plant feels like in your body. But combinations are also really wonderful. And a lot of plants just complement each other so well so you get a much more um, diverse medicinal action in your body if you're making um, formulas it sounds like basically with the tincture you're just using alcohol instead of the apple cider vinegar exactly yeah the same ratios apply mm -hmm. oh it's so exciting and then salves are another great way in liniments which i really like making yeah. and you can just rub on and take in that and oils as well right like calendula mm -hmm. comfrey oil i love doing that yeah that's a wonderful combination yeah yeah and i love to make salves so if you make an oil and then you thicken to your taste with beeswax that's a really awesome way to take medicine because your skin is your biggest organ it's really porous and anything that you're putting on your skin is also going into your body all these ways of integrating the herbs into our lives are so exciting and i know that your company recently started a flower csa which is really cool i haven't heard of yeah. that um and so could you just tell listeners what a cs for those who may not know what a csa is and then what made you start a flower csa as well as the herbal csa that you offer yeah, thank you for asking that. CSAs stand for Community Supported Agriculture, and it's this relationship that feels really reciprocal because you're committing to a longer-term relationship with a farm. Generally, a CSA is a anywhere from a you know eight or ten week to a full year commitment with a particular farm, and you're agreeing to participate in cycles of. Uh, scarcity and abundance within the farming season. So uh, traditional CSAs, you don't even really get a choice about what you get once a week. Um, it's really about what the farm is 
is abundant in at that time. So it's a really sweet way to begin to understand seasonality, even if you're not able to have a garden of your own. And it's also a really important economic relationship for the farmer because it's a, a way of assuring that you will have this long-term commitment from your customers. And so with we do an herbal CSA and we do a cut flower CSA. And with both of those relationships, it really does feel like the people who are participating are such an important and meaningful part of the plants that we grow and it's so it's just it feels like a really sweet connection um the flower csa we just rented a new field and started to grow cut flowers and it's been a really lovely experience i mean in the midst of a pandemic it's felt quite crazy to begin to produce what a part of me sees as this kind of like and i say this very lovingly but more frivolous <laughs> um plant <laughs> But it's just been so sweet to see how important flowers and beauty are to people. And, um, of course, because of who we are, we're also tucking a lot of medicinal plants into our bouquets so that they can have a second life as tea. (laughs) And, you know, it's so nice, too, to source your flowers and herbs from a local grower that you can actually see their farm. And because often herbs can be adulterated with other things that you were mentioning earlier. They come from far away and may be stale. And the same with flowers. I believe the cut flower industry can really um, use a lot of toxins. Absolutely. Yeah. Commercial cut flower growing is really poisonous and really, really water intensive. And just like we do with our medicinal herbs, we try to water as sparingly as possible in our flower field and really challenge the plants to learn how to take care of themselves. So it's much more um it's it's a, it's much more resource effective. Mm, I love what you just said about the plants to take care of themselves. I read an article when I was probably in my 20s years ago. And this woman was a farmer in Oxnard, California, who was growing, she was from the Philippines, I believe, and she was growing all of the tropical trees that she, from her childhood in Oxnard. Oh, and the cool. interviewer was talking about her beautiful garden. He said, well, how do you get the papayas to grow here? And she said, I stand underneath the tree with a machete and say... <laughs> <laughs> if you don't grow the papaya, down you go. And I always thought of <laughs> that is a different kind of plant communication. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I know that yours is more loving, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we usually don't threaten death. <laughs> oh <my gosh>. and, <laughs> and so we're in a time of change right now, right? We talk COVID and just here in the States politically. And I'm wondering what, and you mentioned this a bit, I think with the plants you talked about, but what right now is your go-to herbal ally? Yeah, I would say Tulsi is our our biggest herb. Um, It's what we drink as tea every day. And it's so connected to your heart. And I feel like for, yeah, you mentioned the political moment here in the United States. I feel like the the social and cultural revolution that we're going through right now is really demanding that we keep our hearts really open and listen to the experiences of others and have the strength to honor those experiences and acknowledge our mistakes. And Tulsi is such an important plant for any sort of work like that. It's just such an emotionally supportive and nourishing herb. And I feel like it can really bring courage. So Elena, I noticed on your website that you mentioned herbal reparations, and I'm curious if you'd want to share that with listeners. Sure. Yeah. So the last few months have just been such a reckoning for us in the United States, really a reflection on both past and present moments and what we want the future to look like. And so my partner, Danny and I, you know, we're a very small business. It's just the two of us. And um, we've always wanted to farm in a way that reduces harm. So that's why we've always chosen to farm organically and to really allow wildness to come in around the edges and find a home in our gardens. 
And we really started to try to think more about what that means in the economics of our small business. And so we've always wanted to keep our herbal medicine as affordable as we can so that it can be as accessible as possible. But we also realized that we wanted to be much more forceful about creating the kind of world, um, both economically and socially, that we would like to see. And so we started to think a lot more about what reparations could look like within our business model. So the idea of being a part of returning resources to those in the United States from whom they were taken or stolen. And herbal medicine has a long tradition of that. People came, enslaved people came from Africa with incredibly intimate knowledge of herbalism um, that was used by, by plantation owners and, and white people without credit or acknowledgement and the same for indigenous people in the United States. So we really wanted to create a model within our herbal business that reflected the huge debt that we owe to people of color in within herbalism. So it's our way of trying to return some of the resources we've been so fortunate to have access to. So we've started to offer the herbal CSA that we release once every other month. We've started to offer a few of those at no cost to um people of color, both we can ship or locally. And we've also just made and are about to release a formula that is specifically for the grief that our bodies and our hearts hold and being able to work with that grief and um, release it and grow with it. And that is a tincture that will be either free or at really minimal cost to um, people of of color. So it's just one of the ways that we feel like we could more uh, more accurately acknowledge and honor the the many lives that came before our own. Oh, I love that. That's so kind and and, um, necessary in these times. So thank you for doing that. Oh, yeah, it's our it's our pleasure. It feels truly like the least that we could do. So, Elaine, it's been so much fun talking with you. I've really enjoyed it. And I wanted to remind listeners that you are online at nightheronfarm.org. And I'm curious if there's anything else you want to tell us today. I don't think if there's anything I would want to add, I do just want to reemphasize how easy it is to grow these plants. And even if you just have a little postage-sized stamp of dirt or postage stamp sized (laughs) little plot (laughs) no matter how tiny or non-existent your yard is if you have a pot that you can set in a sunny place in your window or on your front steps it's so possible to grow some of these plants and they just make life so much better (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they do they do and it, it, it it's fairly easy they're very forgiving exactly they're so easy to grow yeah there's no reason I feel like so often I'll meet people who are like oh I don't have a green thumb I kill any plant I've ever met and I'm just like you haven't met Tolkien <laughs> you couldn't kill that plant if you tried <laughs> rosemary too right it's very hardy yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> Calendula, yeah. you if you would be able to grow it and then never get rid of it. So there you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you taking the time today to educate us about this important subject and we're all thrilled to learn from you. Oh, thank you, Jill. I'm so honored. Thank you. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. 